Good evening and welcome to the Vital Alumni Speaker Series featuring UH System Regent Paula Mendoza, President and Chief Executive Officer of Possible Missions Incorporated and two-time graduate of the University of Houston downtown. First, with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and most recently with a Master of Business Administration from the Maryland Davies College of Business. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> when Stephen Villano, the director of our Center for Public Service and Community Research, sent me an email and asked me if I'd like to introduce Regent Mendoza this evening, I wrote back quickly with one word, wow. And then, and then I wrote, I added to that, yes, yes. Uh, I think one of the high points in my life over the last four years has been getting to know Paula Mendoza. She may not remember this, but one of the very first times we met, we were at a luncheon, and I flipped a basket of rolls over in the air while I was attempting to pass them to her. So already she knew, as I just now almost fell over the chair, her presence it makes me excited. <laughs> <laughs> Paula Mendoza's accomplishments are significant and notable. In 2001, with only $100 in hand, she established her own company, Possible Missions Incorporated, a company that now generates millions and has won more awards than I can even tell you. Regent Mendoza is a leader to the core. The, when you think of her, think of the word first. She is the first Latina to serve as chairman of the State of Texas Ethics Commission, chairman of the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce, and the first Latina to be appointed to the UH System Board of Regents by the governor of Texas. When you graduate, Regent Mendoza will be on that stage in either some red sparkly high heels or some red cowboy boots, and she will shake the hand of every single graduate and then rush off the stage and go to UH Clear Lakes graduation because that is who she is. That is it. Uh, hold on. Oh, dear. <laughs> Coming up. We are truly fortunate to have Regent Mendoza with us tonight. She's an individual who brings herself fully to every encounter, ready, willing, and able to create what has not existed before, to think deeply and act, to help others go beyond the limits they have set upon themselves, to pull people together with her infectious joy, energy, and obvious dedication to those whose lives she touches every day. It is with the utmost love and respect that I introduce you to her tonight. Listen to her, talk with her, and to find new possibilities with our Regent, Regent Paula Mendoza. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I had about a 20-page speech to stand up here and read to you and talk to you about, um, but it's at home, so um, we're just going to wing it. Uh, but what I did want to do is really just kind of make this very just open Q&A. I can tell you my story. You can jump in or you can wait till the end. But one of the things I did want to say was thank you for having me back. Uh, I'm probably on campus somewhere on one of the UH campuses probably once a day sometimes, sometimes three times a week, and that includes Saturdays and Sundays. So I'm very active as a regent, but it doesn't get any better than coming back to UHD because, as she said, you know, this is where I graduated and got my undergraduate degree and then did a crazy thing last year or two years ago, um, two years ago, and uh, went to the Maryland Davies School of Business. Um, when I started, I don't think we were, it, it had been named yet, by a woman, uh, I want everybody to know that, and I think she's the only the fourth woman in Texas to have a business school named after her, so that's, that's a huge achievement. Uh, she's a wonderful woman and, and donated uh, uh, her services, her time, and her financial well-being to that school. When I started there, it wasn't named, uh, but now it is named. I was crazy going back to school. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I own a business, as 
as Dean Van Horn was saying, and um, I'm a workaholic. I'm married and have about five different things I have on my plate at one time. But let me start and tell you a little bit about my history. Um, my dad, God rest his soul, always said, you know, you need to start with a joke. Say something funny. And I'm like, I'm not funny. I'm not, I'm just not funny, but I may do something that, <laughs> that you might laugh at. But um, it's really, really simple. And I think that I resonate with a lot of the UHD um, students because I'm a UHD student. I graduated what we call the North Side, which is up Hopper, Little York, 59, going towards Intercontinental Airport. My husband, on the other hand, grew up down, literally down the street on North Main, and that's what they call near North Side now. But I was from Houston. Both my parents were from Mexico. My mom had a sixth grade education in Mexico, and my dad, I believe, got to the ninth grade. My mom, they just couldn't afford it. She, my grandmother was a single parent. It was just her and her sister, and so they just couldn't afford it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about being an entrepreneur, and I'll come back and talk about my grandmother uh, from Mexico. My dad, um, he was here by the time he was an older teenager from Mexico, but his dad was, um, God rest his soul, wasn't that good of a dad and a provider, so my dad and his three brothers had to go to work. And so they had to drop out of school to go to work. So college, as, as supportive as they wanted to be, they really didn't know much about college. I can tell you that they probably never, ever in their lifetime set foot into a college until I took them uh, to my graduation. I'm a first-time uh, graduate or college graduate in my entire family at the time when I graduated. So, um, and I took the long way. So that was part of my story because I think there's a lot of what, what they call us non-traditional students here at UHD, right? We might work, we might have a family, we might have two jobs, we might have a family but not be married, we might, you know, have, you know, come out of the criminal justice system. Who knows what it is? That's all of us. That's all of us wrapped around in what we do in Houston, right? So I didn't think I wanted to go to college. So when I was in high school, I wasn't a very good student. I loved school, but I liked school because I wanted to be in the band and in drama and drill team. I didn't want to do math and biology or algebra or any of that. I, I wasn't going to need that. I wasn't going to need it. So I really went to summer school to take English and to take some of my history and other courses just to do it quickly and get it done. I didn't do well. I said I just did it to get it done. And then I got to my senior year, and it was all great. I think I had one accounting class, and everything else was band, choir, drill team. Uh, I was in plays. I mean, it was great. It was great fun. Um, but it, as you know, I'm sure it didn't prepare me for college. But again, I told you, I didn't think I needed college. I wasn't going to need to go to college. Um, my mom owned a beauty shop, um, like kind of like a visible changes, you know, a beauty shop with four uh, women doing hair. And uh, she had that beauty shop for 20 years. My dad had something similar to a taco truck. We all know what a taco truck is, like those big vans, <laughs> except what he did <laughs> except what he did was a little different. This was probably you all won't even know how this worked back then, but when they used to sell cars, they used to do interior in cars. You would get a car and it would be like gray on the inside or beige on the inside. Well, if you wanted it to upgrade it to red leather seats or red, you know, velour seats or wanted a different color at the top, my dad would drive that truck to these big dealerships and right there rip everything out, sew everything, and put it back in. So he was kind of like the inventor, I think, of the mobile taco truck kind of business. But he did it for 30 years. And um, that's how he provided for us. He employed his two brothers, and that's how he made a living. And my mom had her beauty shop, right? So when it came time for me to get out of high school and didn't think I needed to go to college, I said, I'm just going to get a job. I'm going to get a job. I had a job since I was 15. I love to work. I'd, I'd rather go to work than go to school. So I worked when I was 15. I lied about my age. But I worked for, <laughs> I mean, well, it's too, late to, it's too late to punish me then, right? But I did. Um, but I went to work at a pizza company. It was, um, if you think of Chuck E. Cheese, Right? So think of Chuck E. Cheese on steroids. I mean, it was huge. It was on the north, north, north side of town by Greens Point. Anybody know Greens Point? Okay. Back then, the only thing that was in Greens Point was the mall. I hate to say that. It's been a long time, but the mall. And this 
little strip center and it had a huge pizza place. And it's really important because I tell this story about what I learned at that pizza place. It sat 500 people. It had a Wurlitzer organ. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but the pipes like galore. It was absolutely gorgeous sound. And then we had Hanna-Barbera characters. You know, like you see the gator running around? Well, we had Scooby-Doo, Snagglepuss, Pink Panther, uh, some others. And people dressed up in them. And they got on stage, and the Wurlitzer organ would play, and all the kids would have a great time. But think of it, 500 people. So it's huge, right? All right. We sewed salads. We had birthday parties galore. Saturdays and Sundays, we would cater to, to mothers with all of their kids and family and friends. And we would, I mean, do everything from blow up balloons to make cakes, right? So this was just like a pizza place on steroids, right? All right. Well, that was my first job. And I say that if it were there to this day or when I got old enough, I would have owned it. It was just fabulous. Now, my business is project management, right? So I always think about everything I learned at that pizza place, I do in my business today. People say, oh, I'm going to go work at McDonald's, and somebody laughs at them. Oh, I'm going to go work at Jack in the Box. But if you think about it, take pride in what you do, because if you learn what you're doing and you learn it well, then you can either come back and have three or four McDonald's or four or five Taco Bells or whatever, if that's what you want to do. But if you think about what you're doing and you learn from what you're doing, and I loved it, who knows what, you know, what your opportunities are in the future. So I'll come back to my job. I stayed further for three or four years. My mother was very, very strict with me. I was in high school by then, couldn't go out, couldn't date, couldn't do any of that. So what, what else was there to work, right? So I worked. That was my thing. I went to school, and I remember I played around in school mostly, so I wasn't that, that good of a student, but I graduated. So I'm working, graduated, teaching dance in school because I danced since I was four years old. So I, would, I, mean, I had jobs everywhere. Still, school wasn't in my future, right? So I get out of high school, and I get a wonderful job at a law firm, very prestigious law firm called Fulbright and Jaworski. Um, half of that's still around. I think they've renamed it or something by then. But this is really important because, you know, I knew it all, and I didn't need to go to school. That wasn't, that, I didn't need any of that. And then remember, my parents really didn't know to push me to college. They didn't, I mean, if I would have come and said, I want to go to school, right, they would have said absolutely. But they didn't, they didn't know how to send me or guide me or financial aid, which back then we probably would have, I would have gotten financial aid. But it just wasn't in the cards, and I was working, so there wasn't any need, right? So my first summer job after college, or, I'm sorry, after high school, my sister-in-law was working at the law firm, and she said, well, come on, I'll get you a job. So I went to work in the mailroom. And this is the funny part, right? I was looking at my dad while I was writing this speech, thinking, here's the funny part, Dad, right? Thank goodness I didn't plan my future around that mailroom, because more than half of you probably don't even know what that is. It was actually a mailroom. We used to walk a cart around with mail, paper, 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 envelopes, legal documents, and I would walk around the halls with a mail cart. Well, it needed to be done. It was very important. I mean, if you know, documents are everything to lawyers, right? So there's nothing wrong with that job. But I walked around the entire summer from 8 to 5, walking around with that cart, and they called me a mail girl. Back probably now, that probably wouldn't be a nice term. But they called me a mail girl, and I thought, what am I doing? And I would walk around and see all these lawyers, and, and they were dressed up and all, and, and um, very few women. If there were any lawyers at that law firm, I don't remember one. And this is a very large law firm. There were receptionists. All the secretaries were women. And then me in the mailroom, right? So I thought to myself, I probably need to go to school. Education has probably helped me get to that next step. I had no clue what that next step might be. But one of the things that I've always liked to do is I've always liked to debate things or I've always liked to talk about, well, why can't we do that? Why aren't we going to do that? Well, let's fight for that. There's an injustice in that. And so I've really always wanted to be a lawyer. And I always said I was going to be a prosecutor. So that was kind of the direction I led into, right? So now I'm at the law firm. I already quit that job because I decided I'm going to go to school. So I told somebody earlier, I was at Lone Star Community College before it was Lone Star. Half of you weren't even born back then. 
but I went there and they had a legal secretary certificate. So I know we have certificates here, but uh, that, you know, for different disciplines and all maybe, uh, or something added to your, your degree. But I thought, well, that's great. I'll go do that. I'll go to the law firm and I'm set. Because there had been women there for 30 or 40 years sitting at a desk being a secretary. They don't even call them secretaries anymore. But I thought that's what I'll do. So I tell you that because I didn't have a clear path. I didn't have a clear path. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just was trying to get to work. And then I thought that would be the, the key. Well, this long journey from what was not Lone Star at the time, but from there to when I went to HCC a little bit because then I got married and had an instant family. I had a teenage son when I got married with my husband and still working at Lone Star. We moved from over there. We moved closer to HCC, so I started going to HCC. Well, finally, I got my associate's degree. But I got my associate's degree, and I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? Still no clear path. I was working. I'm always working. I've been blessed to always work. Well, so remember, I really wasn't prepared to go to school. I really didn't know how to study at school in college. So I just went and did what I needed to do to get through. I'm often told not to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So you talked about biology. I don't even want anybody to go look up my transcripts um, and see how many times I didn't succeed in algebra. I never had algebra in high school. People are stunned, and I'm like, I don't know why you're stunned. I didn't have it in high school. So when I got to college, it was just I didn't get it. So I can tell you time, energy, and money that I spent on multiple classes for algebra. Dropped them, failed them, quit, decided. Okay, so it didn't go well. A lot of money and time and energy spent. I mean, it is. So a clear path is important. All right, so then finally get my associate's degree, and I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? I'm still in corporate America, but I'm still um, really, I, there was no profession in what I was doing. I was assistant doing this or uh, just putting things together. It wasn't a path for me. Well, during this time, I've been, I was reading, and I have one of my classmates that's now here and has her doctorate degree, and hopefully soon, maybe one day soon, will be tenured, and she was in my classes at UHD. But I started reading all these kind of, like now you think about it, serial killer books and mass murderers, and I would go and volunteer at the gang task force office and all this, and I was very interested in criminal justice, criminology, really. What does it take? But what I wanted to do was I wanted to get into the meat and potatoes of it. I don't mean to be gross about it, but into forensics, right? So what happens when I get into biology? Mm, yeah, not so good. <laughs> Math, biology, not so good. <laughs> so I remember when I, so when I was finally applied to UHD, one of the good things at that time at UHD is we were an open enrollment school. So pretty much anybody could get into UHD. Well, thank God. God that that was the case because my grades weren't so good. I barely got my associate's degree, but I then is when it hit me that I need a college education and I need to pay attention. I need to learn why I'm here and stop wasting time and energy. So I got to UHD and criminal justice was just fascinating to me. So I got in in my CJ classes. I loved them. I was participating. I was writing reports. I was volunteering everywhere in the gang task force. Do you guys know uh, or have heard of Senator Garcia, who's now running for Congress? She was, at the time, the, I guess they call him the presiding judge for the juvenile court system. So when she knew I was here at UHD, I didn't know her. I know her very well now. But she allowed me to come into her juvenile courts and counsel the students and their parents when they were in trouble. So that was pretty cool. So that, I was like, that's what I want to do in life. I, went, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer eventually, so I thought this is my path, so I did all kinds of volunteer work. So UHD, when they opened their arms and accepted me, someone with not such good grades, still really not prepared to be at a university, they did accept me. But my mentality somewhat changed, but now I had a whole different set of obstacles, right? I'm married, I have a teenage son, um, 
my husband and I are in a very traditionally Hispanic marriage, you know, even though I'm a woman and worked, I see some people smiling, some women smiling. Um, you know, I was home at night cooking, cleaning. We went to every one of my uh, son's baseball games, basketball games, you name it. So we're very involved. It's a whole new set of obstacles that I'm sure a lot of you have, right? You've got to get ready. You've got to get your kids to school. You've got to go back. You've got to come to school. You've got to do your homework and do all that. So nothing new to you. But those are the obstacles now that I faced at UHD. Well, I got through it. It took me probably from my start at North Harris, I think, what math did I do? Not good in math, remember? Um, I think it took me almost 11 years to get my undergraduate degree. Right? That's right. So I'm going there. You're right. Absolutely. I did get it. And do you know that at the time, I was the first one in my family to get a college degree. And that was key. That was huge for my family. One, I, would, I didn't think about being a role model at the time. I didn't think about what do I do now so that my nieces and my nephews or my sister who came along um, will look up and say, oh, I want to be like her. That No. First, it was, one, I was just doing it to get a job. Second, I, then I started clicking. I need an education. And then it was about what am I going to do tomorrow? Right? So yes, I graduated and it was the best thing. But I will tell you this story. For those of you that stress, I don't know these days. Yeah, I do know because of my MBA and I, that story about, I don't know what I was thinking when I went back to get that. But I was stressing. One of my last classes I had was biology. And I don't think we were in the same biology class. I don't remember if we were in the same. No, because she would have told you I was crying my last day of school. The last day we had an exam and I was so stressed. I had to have a certain grade to pass that course to graduate. I mean, it had, it was like, I think by the skin of my teeth. And I went and I told my professor and I said, I don't know if I pass, I don't know if I pass, I don't, if I don't pass, I'm not gonna graduate and my parents are gonna already ready for graduate. I mean, it was like stress, stress, stress. I skimmed really by the, really margin, but I did pass and I did graduate. So. People say, well, you're supposed to tell greater, better stories, and you did so well. And I said, I finished, and you're right. I got my degree. And I did learn a lot. Everybody has obstacles. We get there. You work hard, and you get it done. Right? So, all right. So now I'm out of school, UHD. I've got my, my uh, undergraduate degree. So I, on my notes, one of the things I had written down is that if somebody were to ask me, because I get that, do you have any regrets? So my whole intent once I started UHD was to go to law school. After, I, you know, I had already turned my mindset to say, okay, you can do this. You graduated, you can do this, go to law school. Well, I took the LSAT and back then, and I don't remember too well, but I do remember back then they said you had to be a little bit over half, like your grade had to be right above mid-level to even be considered at a law school. What that number is, I don't have any, I don't remember. But I remember when I took the LSAT, I was right under that 50% mark. And so you know what I said? I'm not smart enough. It sends me chills, but I said, I'm not smart enough. You know what? Just forget it, I'm not gonna do it. That is the one regret I have. I don't really have many, I don't, I don't think I have any business regrets, personal regrets. But education-wise, I stopped myself from going. So if you all have aspirations to get your master's or get your doctorate or your law degree or whatever it might be, our new medical school, do it. That's a regret I have. Even, and I say this with very much respect and, and not gloating, but I think I've done pretty well with mentors and guidance, but that's the regret I have. I've worked in corporate America. I've worked in a janitorial company in the corporate office. I worked in marketing. I've done a little bit in staffing, bilingual staffing and supplier diversity. So I've had a full range of different disciplines in my background. And that always comes back to my pizza company. What did I do there? Remember I was telling you my company now is a project management company. Everything I do at our company today, I can revert and say, when we were scheduling, okay, if we're gonna have 52 parties on Saturday with 
I mean, we'd had hundreds of kids. With two or 300 kids, how many balloons are we gonna blow up? How many pizzas do we have to make? How much cheese do we have to order? How many people do I need here to, to make the pizzas, to blow up the balloons? How many, I had to schedule all of the characters that were dancing. I had to schedule them, they had a schedule. That's scheduling. All of that, guys, is project management, right? It is. You put in a school, back then we didn't have Excel. You put in an Excel spreadsheet, you know, how many kids, how many pizzas, how many this, you know, divide it, and then, okay, we need five people to work this party, right? All of that, it's basic, but I learned the foundation. I learned getting to work on time. I learned making a little money. What happens in the salad bar, what we did, if we didn't do this and we put this back, how much money you lost that day? Same thing for pizzas. I mean, it comes down to be very basic, but I revert to that all the time. So always be proud of what you do. Just think of what can you do next, right? Or how can you do that and take it somewhere else if that's what you want to do. So corporate America, I learned a lot of different things. I get asked, um, what made you decide to become an entrepreneur? And I told you that both my parents owned businesses, and they were very small businesses. But that's what raised us, me and my two siblings at the time. The fourth one didn't come till 20 years when I was 20 years my little sister was born. So she really didn't grow up with us. So my parents raised us. Um, my parents raised us uh, with that job, right? My mom had her beauty salon, and my dad had his company. I never really thought of, a, of entrepreneurs, right? But you think about it. They employed people. They paid payroll. I think they paid taxes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole other story. Um, I would tell you, Dean Van Horn's going, don't say that. No, they did. Of course they did. Um, but my dad had me when I was 16 at the table with, a, if you're in accounting, they might still use these green tablets. They're lined and they, you know, have one line on one side and then it's like an Excel spreadsheet, but on paper. Okay. So it's very, very manual, very basic. But my dad would say, okay, this is who owes me money and this is who I have to pay. And I want to know how much at the end of the day I have left. That's accounting, right? I mean, very basic, but it's accounting. So I did that for him for, for many years, and I got all his paperwork ready to go to the CPA so, he could, so they could do his taxes and pay his taxes, Demon Horn. Um, so I was doing that for him. Did I know it was accounting? Did I know one day I'd be needing to know how much product I get in and how much is out and how much I have left over and am I making money? Foundation, right? It all kind of just worked its way in. But when they asked me, did you ever think you were going to be an entrepreneur like you are? And I, I didn't. I like going to work. I didn't think about it as going to work for someone else. But when I was in corporate America, um, not, well, I guess now about 20 years ago, I started working for a company that had a supplier diversity program. It was a national company. And for those of you that are not too familiar with supplier diversity, a lot of the bigger companies, government, high school, you know, higher education uh, bodies, they want to make sure that they hire diverse people, whether it's faculty and staff, whether it's bringing in diverse students, you know, so that we have a well-rounded balance in our school to businesses whether they're small business, Hispanic, African-American, Indian, whatever that might be, that's a business. And I was at the national level for a corporate company. But what happened was, is that they said, by way of a mentor who put me in that position, but then she retired. When she retired, I was going all across the country. I mean, it was great, I mean, right? Expense accounts, you know, fly on the plane everywhere. I don't know which state I didn't go to because they were everywhere. But my job was to visit with small businesses and say, you have an office supply company, right? And you provide tools and piping. I would go to you and say, we buy this product. Do you wanna, if you can sell or nationally, we'll buy from you. Put together a proposal because you're Hispanic or because you're African American or because you're a woman, right? Supplier diversity program. I was out there going across the country, putting my name and reputation on the line, saying, let's put the proposal together so that I can help you get work with this company. That's the way things are done. Well, the company wasn't as passionate about that as I was. And after oh, about two years, I would have people come up to me and say, you know, I spent five, you know, thousand dollars on that proposal, and you never even read it, you know? And you keep telling me that you'll buy my office supplies in 20 different cities and I never hear from you. My reputation was getting tarnished and that really hurt me. It really hurt me personally because I had a great job. I was making great money. I was 
flying everywhere. I mean, it was fabulous. But at the end of the day, my passion was helping small businesses get business with major companies. So when I found that that really wasn't uh, their passion or their full commitment, I decided to go off on my own. So this is a little bit of a funny story. Both my parents remember my mom stood on her feet all day long for 20 years. Now she has uh, arthritis in her shoulders, you know, from doing hair and washing hair and stuff. My dad worked outside for 30 plus years. They were so proud of me that I had this fabulous job. And I go to them one day, still my parents, right? And I'm at the time, I don't know, it's 20 years ago. I'm 54 now, so do the math for me. I go to them because I want their approval. I sit at their table and I sit down and I said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to quit my job. My dad was pretty dark. My dad went white. <laughs> my mom's already white, so she didn't go. But the look on their face, because they've been there. They've had to pay payroll. You know, they've had to get employees or lose employees and work hard and do their taxes at night or do their invoicing at night or find a different, you know, shop uh, lady to work, a beautician. They looked at me like, oh, my God. But my parents did that for about 20 seconds. It lasted about 20 seconds. And then they said, whatever you want to do, we'll support you. Right? So that was the coolest thing. Then I went to my husband. I went to my parents first. Then I went to my <laughs> And um, what I didn't tell you, maybe you've gathered by now, that my mother, owning her own company, coming from Mexico, not having a father, they had to earn their own keep, right? So my mother raised me to be very independent, to be a very strong woman. And what she's always told me growing up, she said, all I want for you I want you to have a good marriage, a good husband. Yes, absolutely, because you know Hispanics. Women, are, we're supposed to grow up and get married and have kids, right? She says, I want that for you. I want you to have it. But more importantly, I want you to be able to take care of yourself, right? My mother always told me that. It sends me chills. She always told me that. So, okay. So I go to my husband, and I say, I think I'm going to quit my job. And he's like, hmm? Because... I pay my own way. I have a wonderful husband. He's been employed at the post office for years and years, but I'm independent. I want to pay my way. If I want to buy a car, I want to buy a car. If I want to buy a suit, I buy a suit. And even though he's a good provider, I still want to pay my own way, right? He says, huh? And I said, yeah, I think. I think I can do this. And, I can. and if I don't do it in six months, I'll go get a job. At the time, I said Fo Foley. I think it was Foley's. I, it was Macy's. Now it's so what Macy's. I said, I'll get a job at Macy's, and I, I, prom I, I, I promise I will you know, earn my own keep, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still pay you know, my half of the bills and all this, right? OK, one is, is if you become an entrepreneur, six months is never enough time. But I literally went, and I bought. I got ready. I paid as much of our credit cards as I could because we had several. We still had cars, but I bought toiletries, I bought makeup, I bought deodorant, and so I bought it all for six months. And we're in a little house, and I started stacking stuff up, and I thought, because I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay my own way, you know. So if I don't make it, I got to be prepared. So I really did that. People think I'm crazy, but I did. It was just my mentality of I've got, I've got to take care of myself. Six months came. And what I did was, for those of you that think about owning a, a company one day, I tell this to anybody. Because what happens, a lot of people that have a good corporate job and see things going on out there, they think, oh, I'm going to quit. I'm just going to start my business tomorrow and everything's going to be great. Well, if you financially can't do that, don't do that. I, I wasn't financially prepared. My husband and I, you know, we had decent jobs. You know, we had a son in high school, you know, so we weren't just living high on the hog. So we had to plan, right? So what I did is I went to three people that I had talked to before. I said, hey, I'm thinking about going on my own. Hey, I'm thinking about going. This is what I'm thinking about doing. And they all said, when you're ready, come to me. Well, I wasn't going to wait because I didn't think that would pay my bills. So I had three contracts signed before I told my boss at the corporate company. I was very honest with him. And I told him that I was going to give him two weeks. He gave me, he asked me to stay for three months, paid. He said, just do your job and do what you're going to do. Get yourself ready, but give me three months. It was, it was a pretty good job, right? So I was prepared. I was a little more prepared than normal. I had three contracts ready. 
But what happened was, is going back to that relationship that I'm talking about, how important that is, especially for you students right now, and it might be your professor, it might be somebody that's mentoring you, it might be your financial aid person, or your counselor. Relationships matter. I had made those relationships with those folks in the community. They knew who I was. We had done community service work together. They knew that whatever I promised them that I would do, that, that they could count on me. And so I was set for a little while. I was set for about two years. And then what happened is, is I started building on that. And I started bidding on projects. And that's where the project management piece came in. The project management piece that we now work with in 13 different states in, in the United States. We work in over 35 major universities. We have employees, I have to look in my head. We have employees all around Texas, New York, Colorado, and Florida. And all of this stemmed from the idea that I didn't want to ruin my reputation within the company. Can you do something outside that's not going to hurt you and still earn a living, right? So it was a leap of faith. I took it. And it was fabulous. And 18 years later, I'm, we are still doing really well. And I say we because it's not. I am the sole owner, but I would not have this company without the team that I have behind me. So it's about reputation, relationships, and your team that you surround yourself with, which is really important. So two years ago, I decided, I don't know what. I don't. I, my husband and I. Um, uh, we're going through some some troubled family times. Not not married or not. I find a better way to say that. But we were going through some things with some family members, and I was not in a good place. And I thought I need to get up. I need to get out. I need to do something. And why it led me to the business school, I don't know. But I sit on the board of regents for the University of Houston system, right? So I'm on campus all the time. School is my passion. But what I thought was, is I need to get myself out of this rut. I need to think differently. Um, an MBA would be a personal, you know, something for me to gain personally. But then the other thing that I stood out, when I got my letter of acceptance, I went into our conference room at work. And I employ a lot of UHD, former students, alumni. And I also employ a lot of young women. And so I took that letter out. And I sound kind of corny. But I took the letter out in the conference room and I said, hey, guys, I got my acceptance letter for University of Houston downtown MBA program. I said, I want to lead by example. Some of you just finished your bachelor's degree. They had just graduated. And I said, I'm going to do it. And if I can do it, then you can do it. So I think that was my second reason, is I really wanted to lead by example, to say, OK, yes, I needed it. I needed it personally. I needed something a little different. But when I got into the program, something totally different opened up to me. OK? It wasn't about educa education just by itself. It now became a team thing. It became learning. It became meeting other people like my professors, the associate deans. And I'll tell you a little secret. When I started school, or actually through my whole two years, there were probably this many people that knew. Because if you remember, I sit on the Board of Regents. And so I didn't want anybody to think that I was trying to, you know, I didn't want any fav favoritism. So and <laughs> I say that. I didn't want anybody to know. I told, I think, the president and the dean at the time. Because out of respect, I was on their campus. And I didn't want them to think I was spying on them, you know? So, but my professors didn't know. When I did my application, I took everything in reference to U of H off my resume and everything because I wanted to get it on my own merit. So I did that. But when I got into the MBA program, which maybe this might sound like a commercial, and it so is, um, but there was so much that came from that program. I learned a lot. People say, oh, well, you already own a business, and you have employees, and you're everywhere. And I said, but I learned the hard way. I started my business the hard way. Payroll, HR issues, um, how to, how to um, bid projects that you're doing. I did all that the hard way. Is there methodology behind that? Why do you do that? Why do people you know, do this methodology when they talk about this? I mean, I'm like, I had no idea. Why, why do people act the way they do? 
Bosses used to tell, or they used to tell me when I was going to business, you have to treat everybody individually. You can't just treat everybody one way. And I'm like, no, I'm treating everybody the same. Get to work on time, do your job. I don't care if you have outside issues and you do that. I, I don't care. That's not the way to do it. I learned that quickly, you know, and hopefully I can say I learn. But everybody has different issues. Yes, I still want everybody to be at work on time, and I still want everybody to do their job. But I tell you what, you learn that people have different circumstances. Some of my employees go to work during, I mean, go to school during the day. They take like an extended lunch and come downtown, or they go to Lone Star. Some of them are at HCC. Some of them go at night. Those that haven't finished, some have graduated, and I'm pushing them to go. But you learn those things. I learned, not, I learned that a little bit more. But when I got into the MBA program, I learned why people do what they do. I learned that there's a reason behind the math that you should have learned a long time ago, right? Or the strategies, or what are the seven effective ways to manage somebody, those things. And then I could marry them with what I was already doing to help improve that. So it was huge. It was a huge eye-opener for me. But I'm going to bring it back to relationships. During that program, I travel. Everybody traveled. I had a job. I had a family. We had deaths in the family. We had all kinds of things happen. I wasn't the only one. I wasn't the only one that had all those issues. Everybody had something a little different. But we formed a bond. There was eight of us that formed a bond in our MBA program. And that, that's what was key about it. And keep pointing that way. It is that way, right? Um, but we formed a bond because we wanted, to, we wanted to succeed. We wanted to do well. And as a team, we said, you're going to be out of town? You know what? I'm going to Skype you in. I'm going to Skype you into class. It's a little different in MBA school. They'll give you a little leverage, right? Or I'm going to miss that quiz. Ask the teacher, can you miss? And somebody's going to give me the notes. We formed a team, and we formed a great bond. But it was a whole different reason why I thought I was coming back from my MBA. So things you learn, things you do, but it comes back again to who you know and relationships. So now I'm going to jump a little bit okay, to business, entrepreneurs. When I started my business 18 years ago, it was just me. And now with the team of our folks that are, we have all across Texas and in a couple of different states, I still look at that and think, how can we do things differently? How can we th do things better? And I said I didn't have any regrets other than law school. But my only regret about starting a business was probably not starting sooner. Because I would have been a little bit younger. I mean, I'm not old, but I could have started a little bit. She's laughing, I'm not that old. But um, my son's probably older than half of y'all in the room. But you think about it, I feel like, oh, man, if I could have started 10 or 15 years sooner, I could have been doing this or I could have been doing that because I'm getting older now and this. So that advice to you is don't wait. If you have an idea, do it. I mean, so many, so many of the uh, new, younger generation, they're, they're, taking, they're taking really risks. Do it. If you don't have a lot of responsibilities, do it. If you do have responsibilities, do it anyway. Just figure it out first. Don't just take a wild leap, but do it. Why not, right? I did it, you know, and if I did it. I was married and had a kid and, you know, all of this, going to school. We all have issues. We all have issues. Don't let that stop you. Well, women, there's hmm, about half of you are women. I get asked the question. I should let you ask me the question. I'm going to tell you the ones I always get asked. Is it hard being a woman in business? Is it hard being a Latina in business? Is it? It's really hard being a woman in business. It is. And people say, no, it's not, and it's really not, and you should. There's, it's not an equal playing field. However, you don't let that stop you. It slowed me down a little bit, but it never stopped me. You just figure out how to get around it, how to do better, and then how to present yourself. So for you young women, one of the things that's key, for everyone, I will tell you, presentation, meaning the way you look, the way you dress, the way you speak, the way you act, it's important. I used to tell people, it doesn't it didn't happen as much because people dress all kinds of ways at church these days, unfortunately. <laughs> but I used to say, you don't dress like you go to church, like you go to the club on Saturday nights, right? I hope you don't. Now, but you don't, right? 
you, you talk to your friends and you talk to them in your lingo or you know how you're Snapchatting and doing all that stuff. You, don't, you shouldn't do that with your employer, right? If you're in class and you're a professor, you don't revert back to bad grammar and doing all of that. You speak a different, a, you know, a certain way, right? Just remember that. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place to be in flip-flops and shorts and t-shirts the way I like to be at home. But there's a time and a place for everything. For us women, it's even more important. You know, we want people to respect us and who we are and what we do than act like it. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be so different and that you can't be your own person. Because people say, well, I want to dress like this and I want to dress like that. You can do it. Just be respectful of yourself and present yourself well. That's all there is to it. You can be a strong woman in business. But just know what we do, sometimes we have to do it twice as much and twice as hard. But you can do it. All right? So don't let that be a barrier. Is it challenging? Yes, it is. On the Latina side, I would probably say more of a woman has been my challenge than Latina. I'm just a kind of a double whammy there. But it is what it is. I haven't let it stop me. You have, everybody has their passions and their goals. It doesn't matter what color you are or what race you are or what gender you are. Your passion is your passion. Just take it and run with it, right? So mine is small business and education. So whatever that entails, and I just hit it full force and go with it, right? Um, Mentors, for those of you that have mentors, it can be your brother, it can be your sister. It can be my biggest cheerleader was my mom. You know, even though she was really hard on me, she's my mom. But I have several mentors. I have women mentors and I have men mentors. I have a political mentor and I have a business mentor. And I have the mentors that it's a group of CEO ladies. And I'm talking from a business from, you know, one employee to a business of $900 million. And there's five of us, and we sit at a table once every three months. And you know what? We all have the same issues. No matter how big your business is or how small, you all have employees, you all have to pay payroll. So we sit there and we talk about our issues, we talk about our challenges, but most importantly, we talk about our successes. What have you done? How has that happened? Well, how did that happen? And share it. There's enough business to go around. Don't, be, don't think that there's not. Share it. That's important because I didn't get to where I am by myself. I can count, I can give you countless people that have paved that road for me. Yes, I might have been the first this, 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 but I was only the first in those. There were like a trail of women behind me that were paving that way, way for me, for me. And I know some of them for me personally that said, I will do this and you're coming behind me. So you guys remember to do that, guys and gals, right? Reach back. Don't forget. Sometimes it's a little difficult when you get up in the corporate world or you've graduated and you've gone on to do other things. I did that when I left UHD. But I had to get my life in order. You know, I had to get my family. I had been in school and do all that. Do it. But come back. Come back to your university, wherever it may be, wherever you finish from. Hopefully it's here. But just remember, that's really key. So that's kind of in a nutshell, a long a nutshell. But you guys ask me questions? Yeah. Good <laughs> so. Questions? Anybody? Your videos taking them so we can, so everyone can see it for years to come. Oh, yay. So if you, <laughs> yeah. Yay. So if you have a question, will you raise your hand and you will Questions. Oh, oh, that was, oh, the, you were going to tell the story of your grandmother. So he, he reminded me to tell the story of my grandmother. And you know, I, don't, I didn't put this together until about two years ago, which you think, really? Wow. But you hear stories. You know, your mothers are telling you stories, or you're with all your tias in the room, and, and everybody's telling stories. When my grandmother, who had my, uh, her two daughters, my mother and her sister, when she lived in Mexico, where we went every month while we were growing up, so we went back and forth. My grandmother used to make tortillas in her house, and, and they have little, in Mexico it's a little different, they have, like, they really are corner stores. Almost at every other block, there's a little tienda, there's a little store. And, you know, you sell gum, and you sell sometimes beer and soda, because there's not a lot of water drank in, uh, uh, 
in Mexico. So they have all of that there. But they're li literally a little corner store. And she would do the tortillas in the morning, and she would go and she would sell them to the different little stores. And I thought to myself, gosh, I ne I've never looked at my grandmother as being an entrepreneur. But hers was, she was survival, right? They didn't have money to eat. My mother will tell you, you know, they had beans and crema, which is like a Mexican sour cream, and tortillas. That's what they would eat. But my grandmother would go to each corner store every morning. She'd get up and roll her tortillas and go from the corner stores. And, you know, you don't think about things like that, that that's where our foundation comes from. But I will tell you also that there's a fabulous taco uh, place not too far from here. And one day our, our goddaughter, who we helped raise, was we were all there. And she was little. might have been eight or nine. And the ladies are there in the, in the window doing the tortillas. And I mean, they're doing tortillas. I mean, because they sell hundreds of tacos. And um, she looks in there and she's looking at it. She goes, oh, Nina, I, I want to do that. I want to do that when I grow up. And I said, Mamita, I said, great. You can learn how to do that. But when you grow up, I want you to own this place. Right? <laughs> so sometimes. But you think about it, right? Somebody's got to own it. It's either going to be you or it's going to be me. Why not? you got to learn the trade. We're going to learn it anyway as Latinas, right? Mines weren't so good. Mines weren't very round. But you got to learn it. Why not make money at doing it? And then why not employ people that are doing it? So that's the way I see it. That was the story about her, my grandma, an entrepreneur. What does being a regent involve? Ooh, all right. So a University of Houston system regent, we're over all of the campuses. Clear Lake, Victoria, uh, downtown, central, and then all of the teaching sites, where it's Pearland, Sugarland, Katy, North. So our job is we pretty much approve or advise on, it could be what new programs you're going to have, what new, if you're going to have a doctoral program here at downtown, if you're going to get a student center, if we need funds for the student center, do you want to build a new building? Um, it, it goes from that to you know what athletics we're going to have. I mean, it's a wide range of what we're responsible for, but we're responsible for all of that. And of course, most of the faculty and staff get that ready and then brief us on it. But it's pretty, it's pretty widespread. So we can be anywhere, like I said, three times a day, every day of the week. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty awesome appointment. And it was an appointment uh, by the governor. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for the region? That's it. I must have been pretty good. Yeah. Hello. I love your t-shirt, by the way. So I did it because I already had a business. And I thought that that was the right thing to do because I thought it could help me further my business. Um, it was The concentration was in leadership, which I do a lot of things in the community as well. And so I wanted to focus a little bit on that. And to be honest with you, as much as I love it, as much as I it, it, sadly still would love to be in criminal justice in some shape or form or fashion, I don't think I will be. And so I directed my efforts to something I was already doing. That's, that's the reason I did it. And because the program, oh, I'll tell you, this is the second part of this commercial. So the fact that I might have to take an entrance exam to get into, to get my master's, yeah, no. No, I'm not gonna. So they have the, start, the soft start program. So the first year you take your concentration and you can get a certificate. You can quit there. but. If you make all A's and B's, don't call me on that. I think if you make all A's and B's, you don't have to take the entrance exam. I guess that means you've kind of proven that you, that you can do the rest. So that allowed me. So that sold me on that program. I guarantee, hands down, that sold me. And I thought, OK. And then I tell you, I had to think twice after the first year. I, I did well. I did well. I was very proud of myself. But I thought, this is crazy. What am I doing? I'm coming to school every Thursday. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to go homework. And I still have to go do things over here. So about this much thought of not doing the second half. Because I wasn't quitting. I mean, I actually finished. I really wasn't quitting. 
And then I thought, my grade eight, these group of women that I was telling you about that we formed a bond, they said, oh, no, you're coming. So we kind of we kind of decided together. So I finished. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Y'all let me off easy? Oh, you sure? Well, okay then. So can I, let me ask a couple of questions in of you guys. So how many of you are, is, are there any seniors in here? So I would tell you that I hope this is something that every university has a hard time doing. I would hope that you come back and give back to your university. It took me a long time to get back. I had a long way, I mean, to get here. But when I was asked if I would sit on the Board of Regents, it was on my bucket list because I did go here and it gave me an opportunity to succeed. So I would just tell you, all of you, but mostly seniors, because you're almost done, don't forget about us. And as much as we'd like for you to donate money and give back that way, it doesn't always have to be financial, right? The president will probably knock me over the head and say, don't say that. But, but, but it's true. Come back and volunteer or come back and talk to classes or come back and help with some of the outside programs, it, what, whatever it might be in. That's kind of how I fulfilled some other things I did was getting, when I did the criminal justice, if I had to volunteer to get my field of criminology, I guess, because I wasn't in the business. So maybe you come back and give back. It's really important. It really is that if you'll come back and give back to the university that has given you know you your education. I know for me, it did and it meant a lot. It just took me a long time to get back, but I'm back. Mm -hmm. so what exactly do you do in your business? What, what is your business? So um, the work that we do with the federal government and projects, so we, I like to say, we'll bid on any project that has a start and an end date. And everybody said, well, everything has that. Well, not really. In the federal government, you have to bid work all of the time and all of it has an end date. In our case, we focused in the, in the government with technology and logistics. So a technology project, for example, that we have in Alabama, we manage all of their Oracle Microsoft licenses for the Air Force. So there's over 900,000 licenses for the Air Force. Well, I have a project management office in Alabama, and they sit there and they do contract negotiations, they issue license, they reharvest license, and that's what they do. So that's a little bit more of technology. But we have a project manager, we have a project plan, and it ends, it, it ends every year we have to get extended. Um, so good thing about it, it's gone nine years already, but it does end, and if we don't perform, we don't get awarded that contract. So that's a little bit more on the technology side. The, um, another job that we have done in, in logistics is, we took, um, and this is one of our, my claim to fame, the success story from the company, is um, we had a company come to us and ask us if we would um, take and reprogram cell phones and put the battery in, check the battery, put it back in, f close up the, the um, packaging. And so we literally uh, figured out the logistics and partnered with a company and took all of those phones, brought them into a, a, a warehouse, a, a nice warehouse, right, a logistics a manufacturing, and we set up 500 W-2 employees, 500 W-2 employees. And we set that up, that was supposed to be a 12-month project. We were supposed to have 130 employees by, in 30 days. We had 130 in 30 days, and we ended up with 590 days for that project. So this is, this is the success piece where I think, okay, I, all these gray hairs were. Our weekly payroll, because we paid weekly, and we had three shifts. So remember, it's a lot of people, a lot of shifts. Our payroll was $350,000 a week. Ooh, a week. <laughs> That's when you have good bankers, a good CPA, and friends that you have to go and say, my client didn't pay me today. That's a lot of money. You can only get so many lines of credit, right? And, uh, and this was probably about six years ago, so I wasn't at the point where I am now. But the best part of that is, is that I was employing 500 people, 500 people. That was pretty cool. But that was more of the logistics piece. But that's what I say is when you, when you on Fridays, when payroll hit the bank, I'd be like, Whew. and then I'd be, here we go again. <laughs> but 12 months and we never missed a payroll. There were times when I was texting my banker saying, I just deposited a check. Please, please make sure it clears. Please, payroll is tomorrow. So you've got to have good relationships. Back to the relationships. You've got to have good relationships. 
So a company came to you and said, we need this, this, we need the, the stuff done with the phones, change the batteries and repackage them. And then, and then you then found the people to do that. Right. That was the project. Right. Mm -hmm. How did you get your first three projects? When you said you had your first three contracts before you were still employed, so how did you get those? So the first three is I was actually doing some work with a nonprofit and volunteer work. But because I was managing a lot of their programs, just volunteer wise, when I told them I was going out on my own, they asked me if I would come run those programs for them for a fee. And so that was one of them was because, again, relationships, they knew who I was, they knew that they could count on the work that I was doing, so they asked me, we need somebody to do it, we're going to pay somebody, will you do it? So one was really based on relationships, something I was doing for free, they needed to do it, they knew I was available, so then I became doing it. But, so, but they asked you to do it as just one person doing it, and then you then, and then it grew, and then you brought more people? Right, so every time, depending on the project, do I need two people? We go back to those formulas, right? How long is it going to be? How many people do we need? What are we going to be doing? Am I going to do it? At the time, yes. For the first probably five or six years, I didn't have more than five employees total. So yeah, a lot of it gets done. I still do a lot of the work myself, only because I'm a little controlling. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I've learned how to delegate in my MBA program. <laughs> I learned a little bit more how to trust and delegate, but. That's hard, yeah. Yeah, but it, you know, we'll, we'll bid on a job. If I think we can do it, I go out and find the subject matter expert whether it's in technology or logistics, if I can find that subject matter expert to come in on board, which they're, all, they're out there, contractors are out there, they'll come and say, sure, I'll work with you for two years. This is what we'll do. We'll bid it, and if we win it, he comes on board. He or she comes on board. He or she comes on board. Mm -hmm. we're, we're on tape, so we, that, that's why I want to pass the microphone and make sure we get everything, everyone's comments. Um, that, that was kind of related to where I was going to go, which is now that you have all of these awesome employees, like where, what do you personally, like what does your day to day look like? Do you have your hands in everything or are you like, like biting at the grip saying, oh my God, please do this for me. I, I, I promise I won't do it or. So do you want my day job or the job that I do volunteer? They mix, right? They intermix. Right. Okay. Let me tell you a work job and then I'll kind of tell you about the, how my volunteer service or my community service. And so on a normal, I'm probably at the office at about 7 a.m. Uh, my staff doesn't get there till about 8. Um, I go very quickly, go over some financials, not in detail because my senior accountant, an UHD grad, um, is my senior accountant. She does most of that. I still look over everything. We don't do very many sign checks. I actually leave a book of sign checks. We probably write 10 a month max, everything else is electronic. So really, I still have full control of my books and my bank accounts. Um, I come in and do kind of, we, we, the other side, we have another side of the business, we sell product. We sell research supplies and equipment. And that's where all the universities come in. So I come in and make sure, do we have new clients? Who's touching our new clients? Have you followed up with any clients? I'm very much, I'm, I'm a big on customer service. And my customer service representatives are, you know, they're on the younger side. And so I'm trying to train them that it's not about emailing and forget about it. Call them. You know, if they don't answer, call them again, leave them a message, then send them an email. So I get involved in the customer service. They probably like it when I don't, but I do. Um, and then I check with my, uh, my administrator um, and say, what's going on? So I really oversee about, and when I say oversee, just about 90% of what goes on but I don't do hands-on much anymore. I still, I still get involved in the clients. I do quarterly business reviews. I go out of town to meet with the clients. Um, and I always now take someone with me because I'm training them. And if I can't go, I can't be in two places. So that's relatively an, an easy day, right? If I interject what I do for the university and other, I sit probably on five different boards. Um, I'll probably either go or not go to the office at 7, but I will be somewhere at 7 or 7.30 for a breakfast meeting. Probably I'll go to breakfast. I'll have co conference calls to and from the meeting at 10, whether it's with this university or it's another organization or a new client. Um, I'll give you an example. Is tomorrow Friday? Tomorrow's Friday. I have a breakfast meeting with a potential client. 
I have an office, two office calls, one at nine and one at 10 for business. I've got a lunch meeting with a potential new client. Then I've got a U of H meeting at 1.30 here uh, with the public art committee. And then I have to pick up my girl at four. So that's, that's more of an ordinary day. <laughs> it's, it's, it, comes, it, it goes, but time management, that's one of the things I have a lot of the youngsters ask me about or the younger folks ask me about is time. How do you do it all? And I tell them, we can, we're women. You still gotta look good. That's why I said my trunk, look, my trunk looks like a closet. I got all kinds of shoes, all kinds of jackets in there. Um, but you do what you gotta do, right? But I tell you what, probably, I, I, I'm not sure there's busy men. Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I know you're busy. But I think we handle a lot more than, than our counterparts. <laughs> we get things and we get things done, right? Uh -huh. And I and I always I always say that, and I say, and we get it done, and we get it done with our red lipstick too. <laughs> I think we're done with questions. No. <laughs> I had a question about you had talked about mentorship and giving back, and um, now that you've graduated with your master's degree, have you ever thought about coming back as maybe a, a part-time faculty member or? Uh, an adjunct faculty member, uh, in, in, or do you foresee that maybe in the long term, coming back and sharing what you've learned um, through your own uh, business as well as uh, your, your academic uh, pursuits with, with new students? You're gonna hit that. That's my weakness for, for different reasons, I think. So I thought you were gonna say, did you wanna pursue your doctorate? And I, can't, and I can't say what I would like to say because we're on tape. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> um, uh, I hate to say it when I'm on tape, but I just, I don't, think, I don't think that I'm an instructor. I don't think I can get in front of a class and teach like the professors that I had. I, I, I don't think I can. I don't think that's me. Do I share? Will I share? I think I do that quite a bit, but I just do it more like this or more one-on-ones. Um, and that's why for the doctorate, I mean, not to mention, I, I, I just don't think I have it in me. I don't, I don't think I have. Um, three of our women in our group, eight, uh, group of eight are going for their doctor, doctorates and we are just like, just cheering them on. Cause I think that's just incredible. And, but I, I I would rather, I like doing things like this better, or if I have somebody say, will you mentor me, I'm, having, I'm starting a business, or I'm at a corporation and I need a little guidance. That's where I think I might bring more of a strength as opposed to being in a classroom. I, I, I just don't think I have that to offer people. It's kind of different, I guess. I, I just feel like I can offer different things. Um, I guess that, does that answer? I will tell you that um, I'm often told like, Dean Van Horner, when I, um, you know, say, you know, doctor to you, or, and then you say, oh, no, just call me Judith, or just call me. That, to me, I respect people that have done that. I think that's huge. When, when I came back, and I think it was one of my first talks that I gave, then you were in the room, right? And remember, she was in class with me way back when. Um, her transcripts probably don't look like mine, Dean Van Horner. So. <laughs> but... Um, when I saw her and I knew she had gone back to get her doctorate and had been for some time, that was, oh my God, so inspiring and so enlightening for me that somebody that I had gone to class with had done that and come back. So I don't know. I just, I just, I just see you guys at a totally different level. I just do. But I, I, I think I, this is the way I would give back in that respect. But, um, but I support my women. They're getting their doctorate, but they're all over it. I mean, they're... They're going for it. One of ours is teaching, and she's, she's already teaching after her master. So, um, yeah, I think I just prefer to do it maybe in smaller groups or one-on-one, -on -one, or I, I always give advice. I always try to give my advice. I tell you, you do it the way you want. This is the way I did it, and I didn't always succeed. I mean, you've got to go through some failures. I mean, you know, I don't know how many times, you know, you max out your credit cards when you're running a business, and the bankers say, don't do that. Well, what else you got? <laughs> Unless you're gonna give me money and you're gonna give me a loan, what else do I have? So you learn, you learn along the way. Just make sure you have somewhat of a plan. So I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. They, they asked me, you're gonna go back to law school? They asked, and I said, 
and I, I give our dean of our law school, <laughs> I think he goes the other way when he sees me because I'm always saying, really, are you going to give me an honorary law degree? <laughs> and he's just as sweet as, he's like, Dean, Regent Mendoza, you know I can't do that. <laughs> Anybody? No, no, but um, I always say if I won the lottery and did I, I couldn't go to law school and work and, and probably have a life. I, I'm just, I have to focus and very, very hard for me, you know, to study and all that, but I would love to be a lawyer, but, um, but I think I'm okay, but that, I regret that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, earlier you talked a little bit about when you applied, you took all UH stuff off the application. That's very impressive. Um, we're in a room with a bunch of students who are probably going to be in public service. Can you talk a little bit about engaging people and institutions with a sense of ethics and doing things the right way and the importance of that? So, and and when I say I took U of H off, you know, not my degree and all that, just that I was a regent. Okay. So, well, that's hmm, because I just I was fortunate enough today to be at my office until I had to run a few errands, so I was watching the testimony on the Supreme Court, <sighs> sadly enough. But I actually can tell you that I, I served um, for the governor, the lieutenant governor, for six years on the Texas Ethics Commission. And I don't know if any of you know what that commission does, but that commission regulates every elected official in the state of Texas, from the governor down to school boards, municipal judges. If you run for office, you report to the Ethics Commission. All right. So when I was asked to sit on that board, I had already sat on another board, but I had no idea what I was getting myself into. However, it did give me the opportunity to act somewhat like a lawyer, um, or not act like a lawyer, but we, you know, people came to us with cases and, and complaints and things like that. But for those of you that want to go in public service and public office, I hope you were just as good as you could be since you were in kindergarten. <laughs> because unfortunately today, right, the way things are going, they just try to pull things up from kindergarten. But on a serious note, we need good people to serve. We need diverse people to serve. Sometimes I feel like those that get in it for the right reasons get swayed to the wrong side of the fence. It's easy to do. And I can tell you that before I sat on the Ethics Commission, I was, I was going to run for school board, city council, and who knows, maybe one day mayor. And unfortunately, it kind of really tainted my hopes for doing that. But I serve in other ways, in other capacities. But the fact that when people get into public service to serve, you've got to be thick-skinned. If you have a passion, I say do your homework. Know what you're striving to succeed for, whether it's immigration, whether it's small business, whether it's LGBT, I don't know, LG, that. Um, I have so many acronyms. I, um, whatever it is that you are passionate about, all I say is know your stuff. And if you're passionate about it, then you get out there and you talk about it and you serve. So if it's potholes and city council, if it's HISD in the school system because you want more uh, prayer in school, whatever it might be, do it. Just understand that people will come to you or out of nowhere to, to try to ask you to do things you shouldn't. And I'm probably not going in the right direction what you're talking about, but it is what it is. It is what it is. But if you have passion to go into public service, I would say get a mentor. Get two or three. Find somebody that has served. Find somebody that used to serve. And then find somebody that will help you and guide you. Start going to you know, different organizations. Start listening to um, debates and those kind of things. Because we need better and more public service folks out there but it's, it really is hard. It is hard. And I, I love being out there in the community and doing things. But I want to get out there and do things. I don't want to mess with these folks. You know, stop. I, I don't need to. You know, let's talk about the issues, right? So if you want to do that, there's other ways to do it. And there are a lot of ways, whether it's an organization 
that you support, that that's what their passion and their mission is, then go join them. One day run it maybe, right? That's a, that's a way that you can serve. And I think that is so key these days is to get out there and serve. A lot of people say, well, that's not going to make me a lot of money. Well, it just depends on what you're doing. And if your passion, like I told you at the pizza place, I'd still be working there. If I, I'd own it, though. I would, I would own it. But I'd probably still be working there um, because it's something that I liked and that it, it kept me, you know, kept me going. It was so enthusiastic, you know, it ha filled me with enthusiasm to go every day. And I didn't know really all that I was learning from there. But as far as that public service, we need good people. We hope that you don't let me deter you from it or what's going on today in today's society deter you. Maybe it'll help drive you. That's what you need. Let it drive you to do something. But I would say that. Find somebody. Get a couple mentors. Say, I'm thinking about running for this. Run, it, run for a couple of smaller boards. Get, get a feel for it. Get a feel for what it is to be on a board of directors. Get a feel for what it is to have other people telling you what to do. Get a, you know, people think because you own your own business you don't have any bosses. Every client I have is a boss, and sometimes even your employees are your bosses, kind of. So don't let them fool you. Public service, your community is, you know, who you're serving. And you got to listen to everybody. And whether you like it or not, your views, you know, you might have to work with them. And sometimes it's give and take. People say, well, I stand firmly behind this. I'm not changing my mind. I'm not changing my mind. I'm not. But then she comes to you and says, but I need this. I need this. If I do this, I can help you in a year to do this, and we'll eventually get it done. There's got to be give and take, guys. You don't always get what you want. And there's always money involved as far as, you know, funding and who's where is it coming from. Funding is it's hard. In our university, people think we're a public university that we get tons and tons of money from the state. We don't. That's why we're always trying to raise money, you know, funds from alumni and those kind of things because it doesn't come easy. Just, like, have your gator grit. If it's something's going on right now that really drives you to say, you know what, I'm going to remove those people, I'm running then do it, but start your track. Get, get a little experience so that you know, so that people don't just knock you down the first time you're up. Get a little experience. Important to get somebody that's been in there and done that before so that you know a little bit of the way. Get a little experience, a little bit at a time. You'll have plenty of time, but at the end of the day, if you're a good public serv service person, we need more of you, and we need more passionate people that stick to the issues. Yeah. We have time for one last question, if anyone has a question. All right, then. I, I don't think that I have um, ever been around a, a person who has, is just so every day. <laughs> just so natural, so kind-hearted, um, given all your accomplishments. And uh, we, I, we had met one time before, I don't, probably don't remember, but we had met one other time before at some other function uh, here in the college. But when we met tonight, I, I felt like I, I, I knew, I'd known Paula for 20 years. We just, she just started, we just started talking. And I think that's one of the foundational things of relationships with people is that essence. Just, you feel like you could just talk to people. And so thank you so much. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule, sharing your personal life with us. Well, thank you. Very I hope much. You, I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm going to say that's true, too, because you can admire someone and, and think you know what their life is like, but it is very complex what you do. I mean, you, it's, it, there's so many different layers. And it's so, it's really, really amazing to think that someone who was afraid, um, didn't like math, didn't like biology, really didn't, you know, now does something so complex, I can barely understand how you even, you know, what it even means. When Mr. Villano was asking those questions, those are some of the questions I had too. What does that mean? How does that happen? So I think that you've given us as, as I guess I knew, you've given us a huge piece of yourself and a whole lot of things to think about. But just, just knowing you as a person is, is really a gift for everybody in this room, without doubt. Yeah. Let's give her another hand.